Are you comfortable saying how much you guys spent in the drone delivery side of stuff? We didn't want to be failures. We didn't want to go out unless we had tried literally everything under the sun. So once you guys are doing service provider in all these countries, you're making a little bit of cash. Is it just enough to like, you know, keep the business running, your hardware costs, software costs and everything? The beautiful thing about drones and ag is like, it, it kind of just works as a, a fundamental thing. Like if you can get it to work like and fly for eight hours a day, like you're good. So it was really for us about reliability before we even got into any of like, oh, like how can we optimize how many acres per hour you can spray, which we are now doing. What people don't realize is just need a small leap of faith, right? Like just need someone to validate or push you, nudge you in the right direction. Like this works, just keep doing it. Don't quit because there's so many options. Like it's not working. Like, over those two and a half years, if you had to give it a number, how many iterations and how many different drones do you think you guys? We didn't move to like a proper inventory system until like we started selling drones in, in 2020. What's the $80,000 drone? Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Nikhil. He is a Longhorn, did his bachelor's and master's at UT, was at NVIDIA for three years, and you're currently the CTO of Helio, which you started back in 2015. That's right, yeah. And you recently got married as well. I did. Congrats. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. One thing I wanted to start with asking you was, why did you start Helio? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I would say Helio, um, honestly, I can't take all the credit, probably not even most of the credit, because in college, my dream was to work at NVIDIA. And so I like from freshman year, I was like, I'm going to get my degree, go to NVIDIA and, you know, live a happy life. Uh, but I ended up rooming with um, this person, Mike, who was my roommate, and I'd known him since college. And he comes from an entrepreneur background. He owns a ranch. And so like while we were rooming together for years, there was this like always background noise of um, we should do like something on the side, like we should do a startup, like, you know, we're techies, we like tech stuff. Um, and I didn't take it seriously for like a long time. I was like, oh, it's just like some, some bullshit. <laughs> um, but eventually, like by the time we got to like sophomore, junior year, like things just didn't stop. It, you know, it was, and I, I largely credit this to Mike and, and Arthur, who were like my roommates at the time, because they just, you know, while I was off studying, um, they were still like, you know, pondering like how to do business, uh, like coming up with plans, coming up with ideas. I had no part in that. My whole thing was just like make the technology work, which I was good at, but I was terrible at like the other part. And so, yeah, by the time we were finished with like a uh, junior year, um, they had already incorporated this company and we were gonna, like it just, it seemed like it just happened. <laughs> um, but we always wanted to work in drones. And so that's why when things became kind of serious, I was like, okay, like let's give this a proper shot. Um, and we're only going to give this a shot if we do something with drones, because that's where, you know, it was really exciting in, in drones back in like 2012, 2013. Um, and we were all really passionate about it. And so that's when it kind of just like clicked for me, like, OK, like this is happening and like, let's give it a, a real shot and see what happens. So you start 2015 roughly. Yep. Um, this is still while you're in college. Correct. Yeah. How long did it take to go from, hey, we want to do something? to like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. How long was that timeline? It's been a long journey. I would say when we started in 2015, we were dead set on drone delivery. That was like, we like the where we are now, like uh, if you told me that's what we'd be doing in 2015, I would've been like, no way. Um, so in 2015, it was all about drone delivery. Like everyone was super hyped about drone delivery, like Amazon, Google, like everyone and their grandmother was starting a drone delivery company. And so that's 2015, we're like, okay, we're gonna start this company. Um, but honestly, I would say as soon as we started it, we started it with a purpose. Like we didn't start it and then go find our, our purpose. We started it as a drone delivery company. Um, so there was no like, we might do something else. Like we might become like a camera company or something. It was always for us like, we want to do drone delivery um, because it was really hard. And you know, from all aspects, like the technology, the regulations, it was just a, like insurmountable challenge. It still is to this day. Um, but that was really our, our focus. So that's why, I mean, um, I would say pro probably the reason that we are still alive today is because we had that like, like that sharp focus. Like even if it was on the wrong thing back then, we were never like, we were never floundering for a purpose. It was just whether we could achieve it or not. But yeah, as soon as we started, we were like, we're doing drone delivery. And then- And I remember you guys went to Venezuela. We went somewhere. We went to Costa Rica. Costa We've been Rica. all over. Yeah, yeah. We went to Costa like, Rica. Like drone delivery stuff. Yeah, yeah. and that was in 20... I want to say like 2016 or 2017. Um, yeah, yeah, we had a whole bunch of crazy adventures down south, um, which we can get into. But, but yeah, um, 
So how do you go from drone delivery to agriculture? Like, when, I'm assuming when you started, you weren't hell-bent on agriculture as a We didn't even know about it, to industry, be honest. Yeah. And actually, I would say we were against it because we were like, how the hell is like a tiny 10 liter drone going to compare with like a 2000 gallon airplane? Like it just, it doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so it took years for us to even like believe that this was viable. Um, and the only reason that we, it's kind of funny how things happen because we started drone delivery. We couldn't do it in the United States just because like we didn't want to go to jail. So then we we went to Costa Rica just as like a, a partnership with some, some scam company. Um, who wanted us to do drone delivery for them. There's no rules in, in Costa Rica yeah, yeah. at the time. So we're like, okay, fuck it. And just go do drone delivery. Um, failed horribly. We'd spent like a year and a half doing it. Uh, lost a bunch of money. The drones crashing left and right. Um, so really resounding failure, but we learned a lot. Um, and the only, the only reason we even got into ag at all was because of a very specific day there where we were doing a demo for, for someone and not even the person we were doing a demo for, but just like some guy that was in the audience, just like, cause they were filming all the time. He came up to us, he's like, this is cool, but like, you guys should do this for agriculture. Like there's actually a need even in here in South or Central America, because we don't have like all these airplanes. Yeah. We don't have that many helicopters. We're just got people on with like backpack sprayers and like- And they're walking around. They're walking yeah. around. And so we're like, huh, that's kind of interesting. So then when everything kind of like failed, we came back home kind of just like depressed, like fuck, like we tried, you know, it's over. Um, but then as like kind of as a last ditch effort, we were like, okay, like this guy, uh, his name is Sal. Uh, he says we could true, we could do like agriculture. And so we basically took all our tech, ripped it apart, um, put on like a, a tank, like a little shitty 10 liter okay. tank, really small, put some nozzles on it, tried like to spray our own fields on the ranch. And it kind of worked. Um, we didn't really believe it was going to be anything more than that, but we were like, okay, might as well. Like we have nothing else to lose at this point. So then we packed our bags up again and then moved to El Salvador, which is where uh, this, this Sal guy was based. And so we went to El Salvador and then that's when we kind of started doing um, our shift, our core shift into ag, started spraying fields for customers. Um, and that was like, it, it was honestly crazy, like to go from just losing money hand over fist to like, even if you only make like a hundred bucks a day because your drone crashed after like five flights, you still made money that day, you know? Um, which for, for delivery was never the case for us. So that's when we were like, okay, like if we make this good enough, like there's actual money to be made here as opposed to delivery where it's like, unless it's perfect and you have like millions of deliveries a day, you're not making any money. Are you comfortable saying how much you guys spent in the drone delivery side of stuff, just ballpark? Um, honestly, yeah, I, I can say, I mean, it's not that much. It seems like not that much now. <laughs> Back then it was like, I would say we probably dropped like around 200, 250,000. Um, and that just came from like our personal savings. I was already working for NVIDIA yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of, so like a large chunk came from me and Mike who also had some business money. And then obviously also like, you know, family and, and stuff like that. So about 250,000, which was a lot. <laughs> for, I mean, it still is a, a shit ton of money. I mean, it's a lot for trying out an idea, but I think what people don't understand is when you're doing hardware, there's so much more iterations that, like for software, it's push a new build a code, it's your time. Yeah. There's only so much that's really going at the most server cost and for cost, which is a couple hundred bucks. Like yep. you're not yep. really. And software like really scales with your number of users, but yeah. hardware doesn't. There's like a steep up, yeah. like upfront cost yeah. for hardware. What what kept you guys going? So you're down roughly 200, 250K. It's not working. What pushed you to be like, hey, let's try ag? What was that sort of moment inkling? Man, honestly, looking back now, like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think it was just like, it was just like personally f insulting to quit. You know, we had tried so hard. We'd spent, it wasn't even like the money obviously like sucks, but it was like, okay, like we can, money's not a big deal. Like our families are rich. That was something that I was really happy about. Like if I completely bomb this, like I'm not gonna be homeless. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. I'll be fine. I'll be just a disappointment to my parents, but like that's standard. <laughs> so it, it was really just, we didn't wanna be failures, you know, and we, we didn't wanna go out unless we had tried literally everything under the sun. And so like, as long as there was one more thing we could try, we were gonna try it. Um, and honestly, I'm really glad, like I've been so blessed with my, my co-founders that we all kind of have this mentality. And I would say they even have it more than I do where when things get tough, like um, even if like I'm starting to waver, like in my faith, like there was always someone that was like, not nah, like, fuck this, we can do it. Um, 
And so like, you know, we just kind of kept ourselves going and then going and then going like day by day, day by day, like yeah. even though it was rough uh, for years. Um, but yeah, I think it's just just kind of the um, you just don't want to accept failure, you know, like it just feels that like failure to me is is one of the worst feelings. I'm sure like everyone would agree. But um, especially for like me and my founders, it was like you cannot accept failure unless you have exhausted 100 percent of your options. Would you say that credit that to just naivety of like, hey, we got to build this and not knowing what you're building? Or would you say it comes more from you guys have like a certain grit in terms of you want to build this, you know, you want to build this, you know, you can build this. Like what what would you say allows you to keep going? Because what I'm trying to highlight is more it's easy to quit. It's always easy to take that route. But what kept you hmm. going on this route? Definitely a lot of grit. Um and I mean, I think for us, it was always the fact that what we were building, we're really passionate about. Like we love drones. And so we were just looking for some use case for drones. Okay. And so when ag came around as a potential use case um, and we, we kind of saw the need when we were in, in uh, Central America, we really started to drink our own Kool-Aid. We were like, this actually makes a ton of sense. Um, and we started doing research into like DJI, which we can come back to later. And they were already doing this stuff in China. And so that's like, OK, like they're doing it. They're There's a market billion dollar company. Um, so like clearly it made sense to us that like if this can be good enough, then there's there's going to be a market for it. And, you know, we, we can make money. Um, so I think that was really the, the core backbone of things is like knowing that if we are good enough and we execute well enough, like there is a like a real chance this can be successful. It, it's not like because the, the thing with drone delivery was like even if it's really, really good, it's not guaranteed because you have to scale to such a high level of usage. Um, that it, it was still, it was always going to be a gamble, regardless of the technology, if it was going to be a, a hit or not. Whereas with agriculture, if the technology is good, like we were 100% sure that like, yeah, people will buy this shit for sure. Because like, you got to, you got to eat, you got to spray your fields. So I think that combined with just like our, you know, we don't want to quit. Um, that's really what, what kept us going and still does to this day. So how many years in did you, or after did you pivot? Two, three years? Um... Yeah, we officially pivoted, I would say, 2017. Okay. 2017, we came back, spent like about six months just to kind of re-engineer the, the stack. Um, thankfully, like, I mean, if you think about it, drone delivery and ag stuff, are, it's the same thing. You're like delivering it's a payload. payload. Yeah, yeah. So it, it wasn't too difficult. Ag comes with a bunch of different challenges than drone delivery does. Um, I think now, actually, I would say ag is substantially harder, and we can get into the technical reasons why. But... Um, Ag was, um, it wasn't that much work for us to shift. And that's something I'm actually really proud of is like how quickly we went from being like drone delivery to ag. Like it almost seemed like overnight, like yeah. on the hardware side, on the software side, um, we basically pivoted really fast. Um, and then we, by the time we were ready, like we had already had contacts built up from the time we were doing drone delivery. So it's funny how like things kind of like build on top of each other. And so, so why time, go to El Salvador? Why go to Salvador? That was where the, the market was for us. Because okay. actually, even for agriculture, it was illegal at the time in the United States. Okay. Um, and people, I think, were at that time dabbling with doing stuff with the drones. Um, but it was all kind of under the books. Um, and so we didn't really feel comfortable with that. Um, and so we were like, at least until the technology is really, really good, because we were still crashing drones left and right. Um, we didn't know what the hell we were doing yet. Um, so that's why we went to El Salvador because we had contracts lined up to like go spray. And really what we did first was to make sure the technology is good enough, we became a service provider. So we would go to these fields, like wake up, like there was a stretch of like probably like eight to 10 months where it was just like wake up at four, go spray fields, like debug all the issues. And there were many issues, you know, come home, fix the drones up, go to bed, do it again. Um, but it was hellish, but we were making money. And so like that's again like that keeps you going like yeah. you know and then hopefully eventually it becomes easier um but yeah el salvador is where we started just because where the contracts were we actually ended up expanding to like guatemala we did some time in honduras um i think we even been, went back to costa rica for a little bit of spraying there but yeah el salvador is really where things kind of changed for us where it went from like um you know like hey this is like actually kind of working now at this point, you're working for NVIDIA. I'm still working for NVIDIA. So how are you <laughs> spending time there? And Yeah, it was tough. So I was I was still like a, a junior engineer at NVIDIA, so I didn't have a ton of responsibilities, but I still loved my job yeah. at NVIDIA. I, I'm probably like one of the luckiest people when it comes to like career in the world, probably in the history of the world. 
because I had two dream jobs at once, <laughs> not just one. Like I was working my dream job in NVIDIA and then I was also doing drone stuff, um, but it was a shit ton of work. So like I would basically obviously be working every single day, like weekends aren't a thing. Um, I don't know how many hour weeks I was working, I lost track, but um, thankfully I had a, like a really good manager and I think I was pretty good at my job. So I was, I was able to like kind of front load a lot of the NVIDIA work and then kind of like, like you could do the whole week's work on a Monday, Tuesday. Like, exactly. You know. Yeah. And like, you what know, what people company, call sandbagging, but yeah. I don't think it's sandbagging. Yeah. I mean, it probably was sandbagging, like, but I think I did my fair share of the work. So, uh, and obviously like company like NVIDIA, like, you know, you have so many people to, to help. So if something slipped, then like someone will obviously swoop in and do it anyway. So um, that's how I kind of manage, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was like the, the best on my team or anything. Um, but I also wasn't just squeaking by, I was doing like a good, you know, like a six out of 10 on the effort scale. Um, and I was actually growing there too slowly, but I think the Nvidia or so the, the Helio growth just like just way outpaced that eventually. Um, but yeah, so I didn't actually quit Nvidia until 2020 COVID. Did you hold the stock? I did hold some stock. Yeah, yeah, I did hold some stock. <laughs> that's that's all I the paid hype for my right. wedding. <laughs> all, all the hype right now, right? But yeah. So once you 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 guys are doing service provider in all these countries you're making a little bit of cash is it enough cash to go full time for you guys or is it just enough to like you know keep the business running your hardware costs software costs and everything that's a beautiful question so actually it was not enough to keep uh, to, to actually pay us it was it was still around the pretty much like paying our lot expenses um our focus back then was we were intending on just growing as a service provider um so really all the money would just go obviously into like inventory, uh, like renting out warehouses, not even like just like big houses to like store drones, staff. Um, so it was really cash in uh, intensive, um, like driving. So you have trucks, you have to like pay leases on um, and you're like going to these like remote ass places. So like there's a lot of damage to stuff. Uh, one time, like someone like messed up a battery connector and like poured gasoline on it, whole car burned down, took three drones with it like lost 100k in like 10 seconds <laughs> so there was a lot of um it was very cash cash heavy so we we really struggled actually to make uh like a ton of money like we were i would say we were positive but if i had to estimate we were probably only making like like i don't know like 5k a month tops so like definitely not not, not enough to like pay three co-founders yeah and like so it was gonna be like if we keep growing this and we keep adding more drones to the service, then maybe we can scale to like 50K a month, like eventually, and then we can talk about it. Um, but as we'll talk about, it never got that far. We ended up just stopping because it was just becoming too too difficult to do. But I think going that route of being your own consumer was, I think, a good, I don't know if it was a conscious decision or not, but you understand who your customer is. You understand what people need. You understand what you can build, what's good, what's not good, right? Like, yeah. Um, you can build out that way. Definitely. But. I'm super glad we did that. Cause like for us, it was out of, I wouldn't say it was like intelligence. It was just a necessity because the technology wasn't good enough. And so like, how do you know when it's good enough is like, you go and use it. <laughs> and yeah, we quickly found out that it was, it was not good enough. How so long were you guys doing service? Product? We were doing it for about three, I would say like probably heavily for uh, about two years. And then it started really, we started like downsizing really, really quickly after that. Um, so yeah, by the, honestly, by 20, 2019, 2020, uh, we were pretty much like done with those kinds of operations. Um, so why were, were you still innovating drones at that point? So while you're doing service provider, are you coming up? Cause I know you have three or four different like flagship drones. Right, right. right. So how are you balancing, hey, we gotta go provide the service with this drone that works versus we need to build a new drone? or like better. Well, the, the trick is that no drone worked. <laughs> I'm not even being facetious. Like none of the drones worked that well. Like, so it was, there was no choice, but to like, okay. it's not even innovation at that point. It's just like, get the damn How thing do I to patch work. It? Do yeah. So the beautiful thing about drones and ag is like, it, it kind of just works as like a, a fundamental thing. Like if you can get it to work, like and fly for eight hours a day, like you're good. So it was really for us about reliability. Um, before we even got into any of like, oh, like how can we optimize, like, you know, how many acres per hour you can spray, which we are now doing, but back then it was about like, just get the thing running for eight hours a day consistently, and then we made it. Um, so really that was the big firefight. And like drones are, are extremely challenging in ag, um, 
especially compared to delivery because you have now chemicals you're spraying. So like there's a lot of corrosion, wear and tear. Uh, the drones are generally much bigger because you're like, you got to carry like 50 pounds of payload minimum. Um, you're flying low to the ground. So like if something goes wrong, like there's no parachute that's going to save you. Like if a motor goes out, you're on the ground in like half a second. So it's very unforgiving. Um, like, which is kind of strange to think about now because like we thought delivery was unforgiving, but actually drone delivery is nice because you're like a oh, thousand feet in the air. Something goes wrong, just pop a parachute. You know, you'll be completely fine. Ag, there is no... You're not no, losing inventory. You're not losing inventory. You're not hemorrhaging cash, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't think innovation even crossed our minds at that point. It was just about... I guess you could call it innovation and the fact that like we were doing something new, but we were not thinking of it like that. We were just thinking of it as like, we need this to work. <laughs> Over those two and a half years, if you had to give it a number, how many iterations and how many different drones do you think you guys we, prototyped? We, oof, man, it's got to be in the hundreds for sure. Like the, we had a couple of like core model, like we had a, our core model, which we are now calling the AG-16. It has six motors. That was like our base platform uh, from a kind of a mechanical standpoint. Because like mechanically it was all, it was working well. All of our issues were really just like electrical, um, like power systems um, and just things you don't really think about, like charging batteries is a huge pain. Um, so it was really about um, optimizing those things. So like in terms of like the hardware iterations, I would say probably like under 10. But in terms of like the electrical configurations, like changing out motors, changing out flight controllers, um, putting on new mod nozzles and new sensors, hundreds, if not thousands, like almost every day something would be different. One thing that I think people don't understand about hardware is you got to build and innovate, but you, I think you also need to manage supply chain and inventory and spare parts. And yeah. you got to have suppliers and manufacturers. And if a motor changes or like you can't get that motor anymore, how do you yep. handle that situation? So yeah. what was that learning across these five That's years? a great question. Um, honestly, we got pretty lucky in that our suppliers like none of our major suppliers went out of business or like did anything like that. Thankfully, by that point, drones had become pretty popular just generally, like, you know, late, late, just like 10, five, 10 years yeah. ago. There was a lot of suppliers for, for like commodity parts. Like motors are commodity parts now. So thankfully, it was just a matter of um, if we had to replace a motor, like having enough inventory on hand, um, if we had to like change a motor manufacturer, like there's like five Chinese companies that would do it for us. It's just a matter of, uh, which getting it on time and which one we want um so yeah because we weren't really in the motor business so like all of our our main stick was like we can source all these components and build something with them and integrate it in a way that actually makes sense um and so yeah, because of that it, it's kind of a risky thing because like you said like if you're if your radar manufacturer just says go fuck yourself then like you're screwed <laughs> but thankfully just the, the industry as a whole was uh, to a point mature enough to a point where there were usually multiple, multiple suppliers and we weren't really relying on any sole service providers. Yeah. Um, so it's just like another, like being in the right place, right time kind of thing. How, before you guys decided to pivot to stopping service building, how did you guys manage cash flow and inventory? Cause you gotta have spare parts, mm -hmm. but what spare parts, how many spare parts, how many drones, how do you guys, was it just winging it or did you have like a system to figure that out? We did have having a system. So thankfully, um, two of my co-founders, Nick and Mike, are both. So Mike was an entrepreneur, and Nick is actually really good about. Um, he's our, our chief operating officer now, so he does this for a living now. But um, they really they were really good about just honestly. It just comes down to Excel sheets, right? Like Excel sheets and like some inventory management software. But like learning all of the numbers is what takes a long time. Like here's my lead time for motors typically, and then here's like my amount of like motor failure rate per month. Um, and so, yeah, we just started tracking stuff uh, basically as soon as we went, cause like, yeah, we were you know, starved for cash or like there was no, there was no other option. So I think back then it was just like Excel sheets. Like everything got a skew number, not even a skew, everything just got a number. <laughs> like this is part one, um, got a price, got like started collecting metrics on how things, how often things wow. failed. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. Um, but it was very, very bare bones, you know, just like an Excel sheet. Like, um, we didn't move to like a proper inventory system until like we started selling drones in, in 2020. So going back to your journey, you guys realized that service isn't scalable. Mm -hmm. 
what was that decision? How did you guys figure out, okay, what do we do? How do we keep this business alive? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, I would say that's around like middle of 2019 where we are, um, we had actually had one of our best uh, spraying seasons where we had actually made probably the most amount of money we ever made spraying. Drones were kind of working at that point. And so like the failure rate was down low enough to where like it was sustainable, but it's kind of ironic. That's when it clicked for us that like, this is not scalable. <laughs> like, um, like the technology is working, but we were just running the numbers because when you're running a service, it's all about how efficient you can be in terms of utilizing the drones, like how many acres a day can right. you spray? Um, and we realized, you know, you probably have like 10, 20 batteries just swapping them out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so being in, in, a in El Salvador and these countries, there was a there's a hard upper limit to how many acres you can spray in a day with a drone and it's not because of the drone it's because of the logistics of getting the drone to where it needs to be so like if you're in a car and need to get to this remote like mountainside to, to spray it takes four hours to get there you can only spray for four hours and you have to drive four hours home so like those side kind of so like side quests you have to go on to even be able to make money um and you're like paying for gas for like eight hours of driving and like all kinds of damage we realized that it just wasn't going to be it just wasn't going to be scalable and we had to we were going to have to put in a shit ton of money if we wanted to like we would have to like 5x our fleet 5x everything that comes along with it and we were just not in a position to do that so and even if we were it was just a massive headache like to run like the con ops of running a, a whole setup like that are like crazy especially in a third world country <laughs> you know um i guess now you could say el salvador is like probably a first world country but um, back then, it was like just not something we wanted to do. Right. We didn't want to live our lives down there. And so that's when we were like, okay, technology is good enough. Why don't we take another like six months? Let's make it even better. Let's polish it up and let's start selling these things because that's just way easier. <laughs> like, you know, we sell it. We have our end users use them however they want them. And then we just, you know, we do what we love to do. We just keep making them better. We work on the software. We work on the hardware. And then we sell to customers and then, yeah, we all live happily. <laughs> so that's when we kind of started. Um, we actually left some spray operations down there, but they were kind of self-managing at that point. People had figured out how to do it. So we moved back to the States probably like around 2019. And then by the end of 2019 is when we officially put the drones up for sale. Um, we got no sales for a long time, as expected. Um, how long between going live to first sale? Probably around, I'm trying to think. It was probably around like four to six months. I don't have the exact, I know how, how our first sale went. That's, that's an amazing story, I'll tell you. Um, but it was a while. Like we put it on the website, getting like one view a day, or if that, <laughs> half a view a day. Um, nothing happened. But what we started doing was we started just taking the drone with us to all these like shows. Like we went to Avusi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many drone exhibition shows. Even there, we didn't have much luck because at those shows, you're really only speaking to like consumers, like uh, camera drone people, yeah. like like you're not really meeting farmers at like something like this. Farmers don't give a shit <laughs> about camera drones. Um, so then Arthur and, and them had a brilliant idea to actually let's start going to farm shows. Let's go to like tractor shows um, where they're selling this kind of stuff. Um, and so they went and yeah, end of 2019, uh, Nick Arthur went to a show, I think in Kansas or something like that. Um, and then this guy, his name is Bert. Uh, they were just doing demos with the drone, like spraying a little pasture. The guy was like, holy shit, this is amazing. And he handed them a check for like 20 grand <laughs> for the drone. And he just took it home with him. Um, and so we still have that check up on the wall, but it's like- Never cash. In that one day, we made like as much money as we had made in like six months of spraying. So then it was like, okay, like this is completely validated now. Like now it's just about getting this out there, you know, more and more. So yeah. And then, yeah. That's, that's pretty much the the story of the first one. Two random questions. Is Bert still a customer? Bert is still a customer and his drone is still flying. And is Saul still a customer? Like, do you... Um, Sal, no. The So Sal, I think, is... Uh, he pretty much exited... Um, farming. Uh, he's not a farmer, so he okay. was just an entrepreneur. Okay. He runs his own, like, he runs a bunch of other businesses. But yeah. Because um, uh, I was just thinking it would be super like, hey, we got a drone here. Go, yeah. You're the reason this exists. Here's like a free drone. <laughs> No, we took care of Sal. I mean, Sal is one of our, um, we would not be with that with Sal and his, his partner, Carlos. So, um, no, we took care of them. They're, they're still amazing people. Like, um, the fact that they like even believed us in, in us at all, like, like looking back now, like how crappy everything was back then compared to what it is now. It's like, 
they really took a leap of faith on us. And so I'm going to be, you know, pretty thankful to them probably for the rest of my life. I, I think what people don't realize is sometimes you just need a small leap of faith, right? Like, yeah. you know, you have something, but you just need someone to validate or push you, nudge you in the right direction that, mm -hmm. okay, like this works, just keep doing it. Don't quit because there's so many options to just like, it's not working. Let me yeah. shut this out, shut this out, shut this out. Definitely. Down, right? Yeah, we were super lucky to get the right nudges at the right time and be at the right place at the right time. So there's definitely a, a ton of luck, but it's also like the fact that we kept going, you know, you put yourself in a position to get lucky. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's, you know, I still think it's like 80% luck, 20% hard work, and then 1% something else. <laughs> what was that feeling getting that $20,000 check? How did you guys react? Did you celebrate? So we, you we got super drunk. Yeah, we got hella drunk. Um, and then, you know, but that like, that, that was like, if you think about it, like seven, eight years of just like soiling and toiling and yeah. just being shit on to so, like, this is like probably one of the best feelings ever. Right. And it really like that's when like the rocket ship really, you know, started igniting because they were like, OK, like now it's fucking go time. Now we have an actual customer like the technology is still kind of shit <laughs> like it. It doesn't crash immediately, but it's like really rough around the edges. The software was like written entirely by me. Like it was just like some JavaScript app, like some script kitty app. Um, and so that's when we're like, okay, if we can get a couple more sales in, we can hire some actual developers, we can hire some actual engineers and start really trying to compete at a, at a bigger scale. Because um, at that point, like we knew DJI was gonna be like the biggest thing to, to compete against um, and all these Chinese drone companies. So yeah, it felt amazing though. Like not gonna lie like that. I mean, it's like every, every founder's like dream. Product market fit, right? It's, that's when yeah. you're like, this works. So this works, yeah. If I had to sum it up, you spent seven, eight years finding product market fit yeah. for your use case, right? And what I'm just trying to highlight is it takes a while for stuff to get off the ground, for yeah. you to go, and then you add another complexity of hardware and then iterations and then, yeah. and we, have, we haven't even talked about the licensing required for you guys to build this, yeah. fly it, and then what does that entail? But it was a journey to get to validation and product market fit, and then now, second part of the journey starts which is scaling okay, how do we build yeah. this? how do we do this right definitely yeah i mean seven eight years is is a long time and we made a lot of mistakes did a lot of wrong things but again it's a journey like you there's no we couldn't have skipped a chapter you know yeah. like we had to start with drone delivery because i just wasn't even in our minds at the yeah. time we had to go through that pain so yeah i mean yeah I and mean, it's crazy how I, it worked out i refer to this as like paying your tuition of like <laughs> yeah. you gotta yeah. you gotta pay your tuition that's to, true like, get through like <laughs> Um, you, you don't really learn how to ride a cycle until you fall off the cycle, right? Exactly, um, yeah. So people always want to, like, take the leap and go to, like, buy the course that helps you build a company. But I don't think there's a world where you can skip all these steps and no. just, like, find a product. One in a million, yes, you, you may yeah. have an idea. But for most people, that, like, one in a million idea Definitely. doesn't exist. No, I agree. And, like... Yeah, unless you are that one in the million, which I'm sure exists and damn good for you. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say it's honestly even better doing it the hard way because like, man, the satisfaction you feel is just immense. It's like, like you know, you went through all this hell and, and finally something finally clicked. Um, it's just an incredible feeling. What's next for you guys? How did you figure out what you're going to build, what you're going to sell, your pricing, your business model, customer acquisition. Yep. Now now there's like 18 other pieces you got to think about, right? Because delivery, maintenance, support after you deliver. Yeah. So how did you guys go about everything? So it kind of was, again, just another process. Yeah, now it's a new journey. So now we're on like kind of, you know, chapter two of the Helio story where we have a good product. Okay, well, <laughs> let's not be too generous. <laughs> we have a product um, and we have customers Um so 2019, we sold only that one drone, I think. 2020, um, as we started, so the first thing we did was we started marketing more. Um, I started um, really taking the software side more seriously. Um, and then we hired a, uh, a mechanical engineer to actually like improve the drone. So the first thing for, for us was still like, the product needs to be continuously improving because like on an objective scale, it was probably still like only a five out of 10. You know, just like works, but like nothing spectacular. Gets the job done, but it's not something people feel happy about if they pay 30, 40 K. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Especially when they pay that much money. People get really uppity when they pay that kind of money and you expect them to be, you know. Um, and so that was like a big focus. And then that was really my job. Um, Arthur, on the other hand, so we basically defined our roles. You know, I became CTO. Um, Mike became the financial officer because he has the entrepreneurial background. So he started actually like 
making SKUs and kind of figuring out, kind of solidifying all this Excel sheet nonsense we had into like actual inventory CRM system. Um, Nick, our operating manager, he started getting really into the, the legalities of things, um, which actually I think to this day is probably the hardest job at the company because like you're dealing with FAA, like spray drones are again, really challenging because you have a flying thing that's carrying chemicals, it's flying low to the ground and it's flying close to roads and objects. Um, the only saving grace is you're not flying over people, yeah. um, but that's the only thing. Everything else is extremely tough. And so you're dealing with all these agencies, FAA, um, EPA, uh, USDA, and you have to do things like spray pattern testing. So you have to like actually measure how good your drone is spraying and like, is that even legal? Um, then you're dealing with things like, uh, you know, if you're trying to fly at night, because drones are actually really nice at night because they're autonomous, uh, you can't do that. It's illegal. <laughs> you need it's like illegal. A, it was illegal okay. until like three months ago. It was okay. illegal. Interesting. Um, it's still illegal for everyone that's not us, by the way. But yeah, yeah. And there's like all these things because all the regulations were made for planes. So like obviously they wouldn't allow planes to fly at night. Um, and so, and then you know you have to get a bunch of licenses. You have to get a 107, a 137. It's just nightmarishly difficult. Um, as hard as the engineering is, I still think the FAA stuff is like I have no idea how we did it to be honest. But we spent pretty much like a year just really grinding on on that um, as we were like still growing sales in the background. So that first year, 2020, of like our full year of selling, I think we sold about like 15 to 20 drones. Nice. Um, but that was average still like- Average price point. Average price point, like probably around 30K. Okay. Yeah. So like, I know you have a 20K drone, you have a 30K, and you have a 40K drone. And now we, last, have a, yeah. we have an 80K drone as okay, well nice. now. But yeah, back then we didn't have it. So yeah, I mean like, that was enough money, like we started paying ourselves like a little bit, um, enough to pay an engineer. And then that's how we slowly, we basically just attacked it on all fronts, like you said, because yeah. there's a lot of fronts. Yeah. Um, also like we started, uh, another big thing for us was like warehousing, because like the drones are big. So like, again, uh, Mike um, thankfully already had a warehouse because he, he has a bunch of other companies. And so we worked with him to kind of get some actual like real space to like build out uh, these drones and like have storage for them. Um, started, um, again, like advertising, hiring PR, working on a proper website, working on tools so people can like see what the different models are. Yeah. Um, so I would say, yeah, we kind of attacked it. What's really nice about our team is that we have four people that are very different, <laughs> but we're all very good at like one specific your thing. Your lane, well, whatever your lane is. Yeah, your lane. and we're all like really, really good friends. So like we have, we have this like really unique dynamic where like we can be in our own silo doing you know 100 percent like siloed on like for me i'm always in engineering but i i always feel like i have uh one ear and one leg on every other division of the company and so i can kind of figure out like what the what the complaints are what the needs are going to be and i think that's the same for everyone and so i think it was just like the four of us along with our engineers we just had this kind of cohesion that um that allowed us to improve things fast enough because there was always a risk like if things don't get good enough fast enough we're just going to be smothered by the competition. Yeah. So yeah. How many so you start selling at what point do you need legalities and all these legal um I don't know approvals before you can start selling because I think there's two levels of complexity here. There's you guys selling these drones, you right. need your separate set of correct um, approvals, yeah. but then there's also the person you're selling to also need some level of licensure to actually operate and fly these drones. Correct. So how did you guys figure out that dynamic? Because earlier when you're the service provider, you can figure it all out. But now you're selling something expensive to a customer and saying, hey, you need this, or else it's just gonna sit. And it's just gonna like, sit, do, yeah. exactly. So how do you handle that relationship plus license? How do you even figure out all that? Yeah, that's a great question too. Like the So to answer it kind of concretely, I'm gonna throw some numbers your way. Don't expect yeah. to remember them, but so for us as the manufacturer, um, we need like a, a 44807 is what it's called. And it's a certificate of like basically airworthiness, like the aircraft are good to fly. Okay. Um, that's what we need from our end. Um, and so those we applied for with the models that we had and it took, that was another huge day for us when we actually got our first uh, certificate nice. for one of our drones. It was like a, probably like a six month process. So. Yeah. And this is before you sold any drones. Yeah, this is yeah. before we, we had to do this. Like when we came back, uh, we couldn't sell. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, now the customers, though, is a different story. So customers are required two things. Like you need a part 107, which is like just a driver's license if you're going to be a pilot. Yeah. Um, 
And then you need a part 137, which is the really, really tough one. Um, and that's your ability to actually apply chemicals with this thing and like fly things. Um, so there's another complexity here, which is the weight of the drone. I'm, I don't know if you've heard about this, but if your total takeoff weight is under 55 pounds, you're classified as a different aircraft yeah, over 55 yeah, pounds, it gets much harder. And so our original drones were definitely over 55 pounds. And so that was a big challenge. So we basically, and again, this is where you know, a lot of work from Nick and his team came in. Every customer we sell to, we have to give them all the documentation. Like we can't take stuff, we can't take tests for them or anything. We have to give them like everything you need to like even apply to this thing, like walk them through the process with the FAA. Um, so I think that was just, again, like a bunch of research and honestly, like a lot of interaction with the government agencies. Like we had contacts um, at these agencies uh, and it was just like talking with them over and over again, talking with our customers, trying to kind of streamline the process. Um, Cause like even the Chinese drones, like a lot of people at the time, um, I'm sure even now, um, we just don't even get their 137. Yeah. They just like fly under the book because like the process was so difficult that it was just like not worth it. And like that again speaks to how useful the drones are that people are willing to do this stuff under the under the book just because it's that useful. <laughs> like, and you risk getting fined. Um, but we didn't want to do that. So we, again, like we, we talked with the FAA on, probably like on a regular basis, like daily basis, just trying to streamline the process. We made all the PDFs for people uh, we got our own 137 just so we could have, like a precedent is a big thing, right? So once you have a set of paperwork that you know will pass, you just stamp other people's name on it and it should pass unless there's something wrong. So yeah, it, it was a big challenge. Like, And honestly, it's still something we're navigating because the regulations are changing all the time. Um, one thing we did to kind of make it a little easier was we released a model that was under 55 pounds. So our Ag-10, our smallest one is 54.95 pounds, full takeoff weight. Um, with a full load, full with payload, a full load, yeah. um, which actually is pretty useful in a lot of cases. Like if you're not spraying like a giant cornfield, you're spraying like ditches or railroads. There's so many things you have to spray. Um, that actually works really well, and it's way easier. What are you spraying um, railroads for? Just like corrosive, like anti-corrosive oh, okay. stuff. I'm not a chemical. Like I'm, I don't know what they're spraying, but like for sure ditches, like dams, like power lines. So you guys have applications outside of. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, There's nice. a bunch. Like generally, I would call it, like utility work. Okay. So nice. these are like um, counties that will like we have a, we sell to a bunch of like local governments now, like counties. Um, like TX Dot has a couple of our drones. Um, so yeah, there, there's a bunch of use. It's still not the majority, obviously, um, but there's a lot of use cases for drones for for spraying. Nice. Yeah. How do you guys tackle? So I'm assuming a sale becomes harder when you're like oh, if you buy this, you got to do six months of paperwork. So how do you, like, even after you guide them, you do everything, let's say someone doesn't get it. Do they come back and like, I want a refund? Or how does that work? <laughs> I'm assuming that's probably happened. It, it, does, it does definitely happen more times than I can count, honestly. But the the other thing that kind of, it's kind of like two, two wrongs make a right situation here is because we quickly actually built up a pretty big lead time on our orders just okay. because our production just wasn't, we were still learning how to like mass produce things. You know, we'd only made like 10 of them. Yeah. And so we were slowly learning how to mass produce. And so for the first year, like we had a lead time of like three to four months. Um, and this is still for like, you know, 30 drones, which is horrible, but it's just, it is what it is. So we took, what we did was when we got our like initial deposit in like, okay, order confirmed, we started people on their, their FAA journey at that point. Cause you're gonna have to wait three months to get your drone anyway. And so by the time you get it, hopefully it's another like only month wait before you're able to like go. Um, and so I think that actually worked out in our favor. It just basically shifted the anger because now it's like, why don't you get my drone faster? But then now we have this answer like, oh, like we could, but you won't be able to fly it anyway. So like you might as well wait. Yeah, <laughs> um, you, you had a safeguard too. We had a yeah, safeguard, yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it, I think people were generally okay with that because at least in the United States, like there's a very heavy spraying season in the summer. And so during the summer, like the sales actually aren't like, there's not, people are out Good spraying. Point, yeah. So if you're buying drones, like let's say in August, September, you don't really need to use them until like April of next year. So again, it's like a little bit of luck and just the fact that the season works in the way where you have a bunch of buffer time. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we were able to, again, kind of get away with it um, just from a timing perspective. Random sidetracked question. How much did you learn about farming and agriculture that you didn't think you would now know? I learned a lot, but I still feel like there's 
I mean, it's just such a crazy complicated field, like the amount of different, um, like we've done work with so many people at this point and the amount of use cases is just astounding to me. Like we've done everything from like your, your typical like spraying corn to like doing like weed trials where you go and you spray individual weeds to like, um, you know, study the different efficacies of different treatments um, or like you, so the drones can also plant seeds. You can just like spread seeds. So there's like a whole other yeah. vertical where you can plant different types of genetically modified seeds to see which ones grow fastest. Um, and then you get into all the stuff about like the the nature of your chemical mix, like how many gallons of water per gallons of chemical, like what's the right mixture? Um, what's the right nozzle like to actually spray? Like, do you want to use like an air induction nozzle? Do you want to use an atomizer nozzle? Um, the amount of variables is just like crazy high. I feel like in the edit of this, we'll just like pop up photos every time we say yeah. something. <laughs> yeah, you can find photos of all this stuff yeah. too. Yeah, but I've learned a lot. I still feel like I'm pretty... I'm pretty novice in terms of like ag. I still, I leave that to like Nick and Arthur. Those are like the real experts on like how this stuff is actually being done. All I know is the drone's got to stay in the air and it's got to spray. And that alone is hard enough for, for me. Um, but yeah, honestly, yeah. Farming is a fascinating field for sure in, in so many ways. And it just makes it even sweeter because it's, it, it's not like bullshit, right? Like you have to eat at the end of the day. So like farming has a real impact and like the, the yield of your crop has a real impact on the world. So it's um it's really like an honor to be in a field where everything we do it, it matters you know and it seems to matter a lot you guys are doing all this legal stuff you're getting sales i know you raised a crowdfunded round we did through start engine right why go that route and why raise that capital it's a good question i think that was 2021 20, that we did that yeah um so we actually were, uh, we had talked to a bunch of uh, VCs and like other investment firms um, and there was interest, but we had worked so hard and had been through so much pain at this point that we were really hesitant to bring anyone in. And it definitely not if it meant any like relinquishment of control of the company. That was like the one thing that we were all like, fuck no, we're not doing that. And so what we actually ended up doing, um, our first like round of funding um, was actually like four or five angels that put in like 50K each. Um, it's like about a third of a million total. Um, and so we blew through that really fast, basically. Just to so This like, is after you're selling drugs. Correct. Yeah. yeah. This was like an additional kind of infusion just to kind of, you know, go over the hump because uh, there was, again, like a large inventory cost when you're going to like trying to sell. Why not raise debt? We did. So we had a bunch of, we got a bunch of uh, lines of credit um, again, that's something that Mike is really good at. Um, so we raised a bunch of debt. We needed more money. So we, we raised uh, some angel like uh, money as well. And then we wanted even more money. And so we, 2021, we went on Start Engine uh, and our goal was to raise a million dollars because what we really wanted to do at that point, um, actually take a step back. The problem with raising a lot of debt is that there's restrictions on like some, some type of stuff you can do. And so like not everyone was was on board with us like just spending a million dollars on like inventory. It just wasn't like, eh, like, are you gonna be able to pay this back? I don't know. Yeah. So Start Engine was really, really nice. Um, because yeah, we were able to like actually tell our story. Um, and then we raised a million dollars and all of that basically went to production and like ramping up production. Um so buying like a bunch of um buying more space, basically. Uh, buying more inventory, buying machines, and then hiring a bunch of technicians to like actually start, Build. you know, building stuff uh, on mass and mass basically. Um, but yeah, I think Start Engine was uh, was again like a pivotal moment for us. That's when I think we really stepped it up to the to the next level. We went from producing like 10, 20 drones a, a month to like a about month, okay. a, uh, sorry, 10, 20 drones a, a year to probably like around like a drone a day to like 200, 250 yeah. drones um, a year. Yeah. Did it, did any of you guys have supply chain and building experience or no? Um, I think Mike had a bunch of supply chain experience just from his other businesses. I certainly did not. Um, and definitely not. I don't think any of us had experience in this specific industry in terms of supply chain. So that was, again, another learning process. Um, but I don't think it was, I mean, I'm not going to say it was easy. It was, it was tough, but it was, it never felt insurmountable. Just because, again, like the drone industry had continued to mature, and there was, there was always some Something. manufacturer. So again, like just being doing things at the right time really helps. Yeah, and um, setting up operations and building a drone a day, 
how do you guys figure out warehouse layout, optimal flow, testing, QA? Um, there's like a whole flow. I, I visited someone in Austin who's doing 3D, like industrial size 3D printers, and I saw part of his warehouse. And I was like, okay, this seems pretty well laid out. But even getting to that point is mm -hmm. sort of a journey, right? Definitely. Um, so guess how we started? A couple desks and... Like, guess how we started doing the actual layout of stuff? Sims 4. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so we just booted up the Sims, Mike did, and then you just uh, started laying stuff out, like seeing how stuff works. Nice. And then once it was like, that's obviously like a silly proof of concept, yeah, yeah. but honestly pretty nice. Cause like, it's super easy to change stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then from there we took it to like a floor planner software and actually did um, a little bit more like nice. robust measurements. Okay. I was going to guess blue tape on the ground, but that's, that's it. true. Well, so, cause we were doing this before we even had the space. Like we were yeah. building okay. a little like uh, a space, um, what we call Bay four now. Um, but it, it was just a pile of dirt. And so we were trying to like, we knew the dimensions it was going to be, and so that's why we spent nice. um, a couple months just uh, kind of figuring things out. Um, but yeah, to your point, like yeah, we started with like four desks and like uh, a bunch of saran wrap <laughs> around a, a hallway where like four of us worked, and then now we expanded and expanded and expanded. Um, but yeah, it's it's still an ongoing process because now we're building a, a an even even bigger space, so we're trying to get to like two three drones a day for our next kind of milestone. Um, and obviously that's that's even harder because now you're dealing with like you know ten thousand square feet of you know production space um and so that but honestly at the end of the day it's like it's harder but it's fundamentally still the yeah. same thing you just have to put that much more care and effort into it um but i think we have an ex enough experience now and we kind of know how we want things to work um to where i think we'll we'll be okay have you guys figured out sales and customer acquisition and is that still a problem or do you guys have a steady inflow of orders? We have a good acquisition flow. Um, there's still a lot of rough edges um, just because things are changing and there's like the competitions improving, like DJI puts out, we yeah. were just talking about this. They put out new drones every year. So there's always like, and you know, there's like always politics involved too with some customers and like some, some distributors. One thing that we did was uh, we started onboarding um, dealers, so not just end customers, but like people who sell like John Deere tractors yeah. and like other stuff. And that actually helped a lot because that's like more, you know, you just kind of open up the amount of places people can get visibility. They become your, your um, brand ambassadors or uh, exactly. spokesmen. Yeah. yeah. So that was a big thing that, that really helped. Um, we are still growing our sales team. We're, we're still trying to kind of become, I, I still feel like there's a lot, you know, like not definitely less than 1% of the population knows you and who Helio is. Um, everyone knows who DJI is. So, you know, to get to that level, there's still a shit ton of work ahead of us. But I feel like we're we're in a pretty good spot right now in terms of uh, of cash inflow and customer acquisition. Um, thankfully for us, we have a lot of repeat customers. So like people will buy one drone, use it for a year and be like, oh, I want to expand. Um, and a lot of people are going from like, I'm just using the drone for my own farm to like, hey, like, I'm John Doe, there's 10 farms around me that, you know, now spray planes won't spray it. I can just buy another drone and go spray it and make a bunch of money. So there's a lot of stories like that nice. where people come back as repeat customers. So I would say it's in a good spot, but there's definitely, definitely a lot of work ahead. Um, Random payment question. Building a SaaS product, getting a card payment, super easy, solve problem. Right. Getting a $40,000 payment, is it check? Is it ACH? Like, how do you, how is that on the port? Because I'm not going online and clicking buy and wiring you 40K, right? So Right. No, it, it, it hardly ever works like that. I guess except that one check that Bird gave us. But that's like, if you're in person, it's different. Like, yeah. you see it, you know, it's real. Yeah. But yeah, um, honestly, but it just comes down to, like, people will put in, like, a quote or, like, send us an email. Um, we'll interact with them. And then once they're ready, I mean, no one ever is going to just send you money. But yeah. the once we go through the kind of the onboarding flow with them and they're convinced then yeah, it's just like a wire uh, transfer, yeah, okay. wire transfer. Racing. Because again, I think people don't understand the complexity of building a SaaS product. There's so many tools and so many ways for you to capture credit card. Like there's yeah. hundreds of ways you could get paid for anything sub a thousand dollars a month. Exactly. Um, yeah. But as your ticket item keeps going up, yeah, no one thinks about this. There's like payment flow. Yep. They'll take seven days to wire. Now you don't know what state. Maybe <laughs> yeah. they don't wire. Maybe they exactly. fall off, right? Exactly. And um, there's just so many ifs and buts, but it's yeah. interesting that that's 
a problem you have to solve that you probably don't think about. Like, how it do is. I get paid, yeah. right? And but, then there's also like a lot of people want financing. So yeah. like we have to bring in, now that was like another whole journey of like, people want this thing, they obviously can't wire us like an 80K check. So um, we have to like convince finance, cause like who's gonna insure a drone? Like yeah. it's not a thing. Um, so we have to like go and convince some insurance people to like add this thing to their docket. Um, and so yeah, we did that. So now we have a couple of people that you can actually finance your drone nice. too. Um, and that actually helped a bunch. Um, there's just like all these kinds of different ways you have to find solutions. Um, another way is, so we work with a company called Bex Hybrids. They're like a, a seed, like they sell seeds. Uh, and they have a, they're like a billion dollar company. So they have a program where if you buy enough seeds from them, you get like store credit. And some people have like $100,000 of store credit because you just buy so much seed. And then so like you can just buy two drones. And then now we just pay, get paid by Bex instead nice. of getting paid by the customer. So there's all these like little ways that you can kind of get around it. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's like you just got to wire us the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've certainly also been, you know, certainly ha had our fair share of like credit card scams and, and stuff like that. I think we've kind of figured out how, how most of those work. So, but we did fall for one, I think once. So it's just what it is. Sweet. I do a couple rapid fire questions towards the end and then I'll ask you a last question. Sure. Um, what, what would you say is your support system? What's allowed you to keep going for the last seven, eight years? I would say just probably classic answer. Like my, my, my family has always been good um, to me and just been really supportive. Honestly, my main support system is just my, my co-founders at this point. Like whenever I'm feeling like, ah, like it's just a bad day, like drone went down or like something un, like rare happened. It's just like, you know, you, you see how they're acting and they're just like, yeah, just another day, you know, like you just got to keep moving. Tackle it. You just tackle it. So I feel like my co-founders have been really the, the main driving force for me. Um, I don't think I would have even made it like 1% of this far if I'd done this all alone. So I would say, yeah, honestly, number one answer, co-founders, family, and then honestly, even my wife, she takes the brunt of my anger sometimes. <laughs> Poor girl, but she's also like really supportive, you know? So nice. yeah, just, yeah, those, those groups of people. What's your startup tech stack? How, how do you guys run Helio day to day? So our core product that we sell on the software side is actually a web app. Um, it's a standalone Electron app built with Vue. Um, so basically all our software developers are web, web developers. Yeah. Backend is on AWS for all of our uh, analysis tools, internal tools. So AWS, Vue, um, and then our actual like drone stack for those who are curious is Arup Copter based. Um, so like a C++ flight control firmware, which we have our own fork of. So yeah, we actually dabble in almost every language there is. Nice. Yeah. And uh, on the operational side, what are you guys using for project management inventory? If um, we're company. using uh, Fishbowl. Um, it's okay. like a, yeah, uh, yeah. not super well known, but we use Fishbowl a bunch for inventory, um, and then honestly, still a bunch of Excel sheets, a lot of Excel. Nice. Uh, what are three resources you'd recommend to someone listening um, to get them started on their journey or get them through their journey? For like a, a startup founder, I would say um, your first job should be to find co-founders who will. Um, push you through the hard times because there's going to be hard times. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say go to any, like go to Capital Factory, go to all these events. And like, if you're lucky like me, maybe you already have friends that, that are interested in this kind of stuff. I would say, yeah, resources probably would be, you know, like uh, Capital Factory is a big one, especially if you're in Austin. I mean, we're a Capital Factory company and that's been, you know, very, very useful. Um, online, I would say you can honestly start looking at even things like start engine and like we funder and like see how these people are, are kind of doing it because a lot of people are making a lot of money off these sites even without having a product um so th there's a way to like get a lot of money in uh, just based on hype i'm not yeah. saying it's right or wrong it just is what it is you know yeah. like if you if you need money that's one way to get it honestly let's see honestly those are the top two i would say see how other people are doing it go to as many in-person events as you can um try not to blow a bunch of money on it though because it's it's really easy to yeah um but yeah, the goal for me is for any, I would say for any startup founder is if you're dedicated, find someone or two people who are as dedicated as you, even if you have to convince them. And then, yeah, I think you'll be fine from there. I do this bit where I ask everyone a question from a previous guest. Yeah. So your question is, what can Austin take away from other parts of the state to make it better? Whether it's vibe, culture, food, whatever you think it is. Oh man, Austin is so good though. I would say maybe tone down the construction. You know, like I live in Richmond now, like there is not a single construction. The roads are nice, like there's no, why does it feel like Austin is always, something is always broken yeah, on the yeah, roads. Yeah, um, Like in Houston, Houston's got its own problems, but uh, especially out, out in the suburbs, like 
there is just everything just like is done you yeah. know and like that's okay to be like we're done like everything yeah. works we don't have to keep adding stuff uh the other thing i would say especially compared to uh, to houston i would like better indian food in austin 100 yeah, we, we are severely lacking 100%. indian food here and <laughs> that's those are my top two other than that austin is perfect i love you know it. they're rebuilding i-35 and they're breaking down the convention center and so that's going to be three, four years, five years of whatever. It just keeps that, going. Yeah, yeah, I just, I don't get it. But yeah, <laughs> what's, it's just what it is. What's your question for a future guest? Oh, man. What was the exact day when you knew you wanted to be uh, an entrepreneur? Okay. Because I feel like most entrepreneurs, like I can probably pinpoint an exact day, probably like February 2019 when we got that first check. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I want to do this now, nice. like actually. Um, so I'm curious what other people like, okay. what that turning point was them for, for, for that. I like that. Yeah. What's next for Helio? Where can listeners find you? What do you want to plug? What can we link for you? Um, honestly, just link our, our website, www.hwall.io or helio.com. Um, if you know anyone that has a farm and wants a drone, like uh, send them our info. Um, we're obviously looking for new clients. Um, what's next for us is uh, building more drones, building bigger drones. So we're building... Um, we're building drones with like you know more capacity. Um, What's the eighty thousand dollar drone? It's a it's called the Ag seventy two. It carries eighteen gallons. Okay. Um, it's like probably around the size of this room, okay. um, but we're building even bigger ones. Um, What's the wingspan on that? About like yeah, fourteen feet. Fourteen feet. Yeah, tip okay. to tip. The propellers are like probably like yeah. deathly. Yeah, I mean it, it's all deathly at this point. So, but you know like yeah, that that's just how it is. Like you got to carry a lot more weight. Um, but yeah, I think next for us is just keep doing what we're doing, like keep growing. We have a good thing going. Nice. We have a bunch of problems still to fix. There's a bunch of competition now. The Everyone's seen that this is successful. So, you know, people are coming out of the woodwork to like try to compete. So it's just, you know, we're playing chess now. Do you hope for either an acquisition IPO or do you want to just keep it chill, own it and grow it at a steady pace? We actually haven't decided. I mean, I think... Um, at least for the next five years, I don't think we're going to do anything. Just we want to see how how far we can reach just of our own accord. Um, an acquisition would be on the table if it was like from someone that was a, like an actual Strategic partner, partner, like a John Deere or something. Um, if, if you're, you're listening, listening me, John Deere, yeah, if you're listening, Mr. Deere, um, <laughs> IPO would also be an option. Um, but yeah, I think we all decided that, you know, things are going well, so there's no reason to poke the bear. Let's just, yeah. let's just scale. Naturally. Ride the wave. Right. Yeah. Um, and we'll see in five years. Nice. But thank you for coming on. We'll do an episode two in a couple months and see where we're at. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you man. so much.